Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I am here today at the Morphe Auction House, where we are taking a look at an MG0815. But this isn't a normal 0815, of course. This is an 0815 that stayed in German service probably until World War II. See, at the end of World War I, the Treaty of Versailles allowed the German army to maintain only a relatively small number of machine guns, right about a thousand, although this was later increased to almost 1,500. So what the German military did is they took the best guns that they had, they sorted through them, and they took the best condition examples, and they held on to those and updated them as much as possible. Well, the most modern machine gun that the Germans had in quantity was the MG 0815. And so this would see, this would continue to be the standard Wehrmacht machine gun until 1936, when it was actually phased out of service in favor of the new MG 34s. However, these would remain in use with rear echelon and reserve type units uh, throughout World War II. You'd find these in places like the Atlantic Wall, and, and uh, they were perfectly serviceable machine guns, and by that point, the conditions of the Versailles Treaty didn't really matter, so why not keep them? One of the other cool things, well, cool for the Germans, uh, at the end of World War I, the Allied powers confiscated most of the German machine guns, most of their ordnance in general. However, the, the terms of the surrender of arms didn't talk about spare parts. And when the Germans had manufactured and issued Maxim guns like this, they were issued out with two spare locks for every gun, as well as spare barrels. Well, when the Allies confiscated the guns, they didn't say anything about the spare bids. They just wanted the guns. So the German military was left, while it was had a limited number of about a thousand machine guns, it had like five times as many locks as it could potentially ever need. So that really helped, uh, helped justify keeping on guns like the 0815 here. They had tons of the expensive parts already manufactured and in hand. So, what do you do if you're limited to an 0815 and you're Germany and you want to try and maintain some sort of military readiness under terms of the Versailles Treaty? Well, you go ahead and you start modernizing those 0815s. And so there are six or eight different things that the Germans did to improve and update these guns, some of them pretty darn significant. And finding a gun like this that has all of those improvements made to it is really quite scarce. So let's take a look through and see what they did. All right, we've got a lot to go through here, so let's start at the front of the gun, where they added a second bipod mount. On the original World War I pattern, you had to set the bipod back here, and that was kind of really hard to shoot with, because that sets it right at this pivot point in the middle of the gun. I've done some shooting with these, they're really not easy to shoot accurately that way. By putting the bipod out here at the muzzle end, it's still not great, but it is better. So these use the exact same bipod. And we'll go ahead and pull this one off here for a moment. Also worth pointing out that in addition to mounting the bipod at the front, they also added just a little bit of uh, flexibility to it. The original rear, mi rear bipod mount didn't allow this. They also uh, moved the drain valve of the gun up to the very front. They substantially simplified the steam vent arrangement. So this is where, well, steam vents out of the gun if you get it hot enough to actually boil water in the jacket. And you aren't necessarily always going to do that, and of course you don't want to just have water leaking out here if you're just transporting the gun. So there's a cap. If you're only anticipating very limited shooting or transport, you leave the cap on. When you want to actually set up your hose, this is a modern hose, but it's an original uh, connector here, what you would do is just flip that on, turn it 90 degrees, and now you've got your steam vent locked on there. For comparison's sake, here's the World War I version of that, which is this big blocky thing. Comes off like so. Really, it's this is needlessly complex, and that's why they replaced it. They also added this bracket to the rear of the water jacket. That is for an anti-aircraft sight. How are you going to make sure that the anti-aircraft sight is actually there to be used? Well, naturally, you'll just strap it to the side of the gun. So they added brackets here. This spring-loaded plunger allows me to take out the anti-aircraft spider sight. This has a little spring-loaded catch right here. So you put that on there, pull the spring, rotate it around, lock it in place. Naturally, you also need a rear sight to go with it. 
and you can't use the standard sights on the gun because that spider sight is so much higher. So they retrofitted the top covers to include a rear peep sight for use with the anti-aircraft uh, sights. This just has this simple sliding metal block here, and when it's back this piece can flip up and down, and that block locks it in either position. It's actually a pretty simple setup. Now the drum brackets also changed. You can see the different configuration here. This was actually a change that was made for the larger uh, MG-08, because on them what they wanted to do was basically be able to hang one of the, the same belt drums that the 0815 used, but using this bracket the drum would actually interfere with the sled mount. So what they did is design a bracket that holds the, the drum a little higher up, and that prevents it from interfering with the, the 08 mounting. Uh, this one has just been dropped onto this gun, and it has been serial numbered to match. So this clearly became the, the standard modern part uh, for both guns after the war. Now while we're looking at this older World War I gun, this does actually also have one of the updates done after the war, and that is this block on the side of the top cover. One of the problems with the 0815s was that the top cover had this really annoying habit of slamming shut on your fingers when you were trying to work on it. So you would lift the top cover up and then it would just fall back down. So this was introduced as a way to prevent that from happening. And you can see right there that little tab is catching on the side of the top plate, and if you want to lower it you have to push in that little button, and then you can lower the top cover. When you open it, because it's curved right there, it's going to snap into position. Save your fingers. This World War II gun has an even better version of that system, where it doesn't have the lock hanging out there at all, but it does have a spring built in. So that now there's tension on this, and it will pop into the upward position there, like so, and it still won't fall down on your fingers until you pull it all the way back down. So that's very much actually kind of like a 1919A4 top cover. I think for me the coolest element that was added to these guns was this newly designed uh, or modified feed block. Because it's got this latch on it, you can snap it up or down. And this allowed you to use both the, all, the old original cloth Maxim belts, but the problem was those, those belts have issues. When they get worn they get loose and cartridges don't stay tightly held in them and they cause uh, cross feeds in the feed block. And even if they're good belts, if they get wet they can tend to shrink and then they'll hold the cartridges too tightly and you can't extract the cartridges out of them. And the solution to this really is to have a metal belt. And so the Germans developed a metal belt. Uh, they had a, an early developmental one and then really what happened was they adopted the 1933 belt uh, for use with the MG34 machine gun. Fantastic belt, but it doesn't work in a Maxim gun. So they designed this alteration to the feed block, which allows you to snap that thing, actually I believe down is for steel belts, and up is for cloth belts. So you can use either one. And these feed blocks are a really cool element for uh, someone today who wants to shoot Maxim guns and not have to deal with trying to both find and maintain hundred year old cloth ammunition belts. So. That's really cool. Then there are two other little things that are on here. One is actually a modification to the gun, and that is this, which is not in a standard World War I pattern 0815. This is an oil bottle and brush for maintaining the gun. They added that to the stocks. And the other one is just so very German. It's not actually a permanent part of the gun, but they added a leather very gingerly take this off. They added a leather protective cover to the pistol grip, because Germany, I guess. And uh, this gun actually still has that, and that is an extremely rare accessory to find you can obviously see how easy these things can be destroyed, lost, worn out, and so on. So it is really quite unusual to find a gun like this still intact with all of these modifications and in as such great shape as this one is. Um, this really is a, a cool snapshot into the state of the, the Wehrmacht's armaments in like 1935 when 
this was most of what they were using. So uh, if you're interested in having it yourself, this is a Curion Relic fully transferable, legally registered machine gun, and it's coming up for sale here at Morphe's. If you take a look at the description text below, you'll find a link to the, there. Well, you'll find a link to ForgottenWeapons.com, and from there you can take a second link over to the Morphe auction catalog page for this thing. Um, see all of their pictures, which include all of the extra bits that come with the gun. Most of it's up here, but I think there are a couple other things that were also included. Uh, anyway, they also have their description, their price estimate, everything else you would want to know if you decide you want to place a bid on it. Thanks for watching.